Hello friends, welcome back to the SNW audio channel. In today's video, we continue with the SNW VFA01 project and we'll be discussing amplifier frequency response and power rail values. The content of this video will be a mix of theory and some practical design. In addition, I am quite excited to record this video since I just got a new microphone, so the audio recording quality of this video should be much improved over the previous ones. In case you were wondering, the microphone I just got is a Samsung Meteor. This microphone was suggested by s -Gross class at the DIY Audio Forum, and in this video we're giving it a go. In today's video, we will be covering the following subjects. The frequency response of an audio amplifier, in which we will also talk about the input network, its requirements and implementation, the mid-band gain, and we'll discuss what should it be, and also the power supply voltage rails, what should be the appropriate values for our amplifier. So let's get started with our first topic, frequency response of an amplifier. Audio amplifiers typically have two frequency corners, an upper corner and a lower corner. These frequency corners are the frequencies at which the magnitude of the amplifier's gain has dropped by 3 dB or to approximately 71% of its nominal value. While not 100% of the time, typically, the lower frequency corner is set by the input network and its DC blocking properties, and the higher frequency corner is set by the amplifier's bandwidth. We'll be discussing the input network in the next slide. The frequency area between the lower and the upper frequency corners is called the midband, and this is the operational frequency range of the amplifier. The midband should be wide enough to encompass the hearing range of 20 Hz to 20 kHz. In actuality, it actually should be wider than the hearing range. And the key question is, how much wider should it be? The current trend is to make the midband about 10x wider than the hearing range in the upper and the lower end. This way, the attenuation at the frequency corners is about 0.5% or 43 millidB. The midband gain should be set to enable full output swing when the amplifier is driven and is rated input sensitivity. Also, the midband gain should be kept as flat as possible to keep distortion low. We'll talk more about that when we discuss distortion in a future video. Let's now look at the input network of the amplifier system. The amplifier input network sits between the connector and the amplifier input in the amplifier system. Note that in this case, amplifier refers to the active circuitry amplifying the source signal. The input network conditions the input signal before it reaches the amplifier such that any unwanted signals are not amplified. Examples of unwanted signals are DC and RF. Also, the network may be implemented with passive components like RLCs or active components like op amps. The implementation choice depends on the requirements of the amplifier. Let's now look at the implementation specifics of the input network. Five basic requirements are needed. First, block DC from the source. Second, filter RF and sources wideband noise. Three, prevent ground loops. Four, return amplifier input bias current to ground. And five, prevent input voltage from flowing. First, block DC from the source. Since you don't know what actually is going to be connected to your amplifier, you don't know how much DC the input source has. On top of that, since we know that DC will damage a speaker, the last thing we want to do is go ahead and amplify the DC from the source. To fix this, what we'll do is AC couple the amplifier to the source. Second, filter RF source wideband noise. RF signals can get rectified by the input stage, and this will also result in a DC offset. And for the same reasons as before, we don't want to go ahead and amplify DC offsets. Also, the source's wideband noise will degrade the SNR of the amplifier, so we don't want to go ahead and design a low noise amplifier just to degrade our SNR with the input source's noise. To, do, to fix this, what we'll do is low pass filter the input signal. Third, prevent ground loops. Ground loops will result in hum and EMI pickup because what a ground loop is, is a glorified antenna that will just pick up unwanted signals. To fix this, what we'll do is decouple the sources and the amplifier's grounds. Fourth, return the amplifier input bias current to ground. 
Essentially, what we're doing here is defining the amplifier's DC input voltage. Remember, from requirement number one, we're going to be AC coupling. Hence, if we don't put a return path to the input bias current of the amplifier, that node could actually float to an unknown voltage, and that's actually bad. To do this, or to implement this, what we'll do is insert a resistor from the amplifier input to the amplifier's ground, hence defining that input voltage to be around ground. Fifth, prevent input voltage from floating. Essentially, what you don't want is the voltage at the connector to flow to an unknown voltage when the amplifier input is not connected. To fix this, what we need to do is put a resistor from the input connector's input terminal to ground. Here is the topology for the input network. It is a passive network formed by Rs and Cs with a couple of clamp diodes. This topology is quite suitable for our amplifier given it is a single-ended in, single-ended out design. Now let's go ahead and dissect it. Capacitor C2, AC couples the input signal blocking any DC from the source. Word of caution here, C2 must be a high quality capacitor. In other words, a capacitor with very low voltage coefficients to keep the distortion low. Why this need? Because C2 will experience the input voltage from the source. So the last thing you want is for this capacitor to alter the signal before it even gets amplified. Resistor R1 and capacitor C1 form a single pole low pass filter that will filter any RF signals coupled to the signal source. A 1 MHz cutoff frequency or thereabouts will do for this filter. While not as critical as C2, it is also a good idea to use a high quality capacitor for C1 since it will also experience the full signal swing of the input signal. The reason it's not as critical as C2 is because C1 will be much much smaller in value. Regarding R1, keep it small. While we have not talked about noise yet, it turns out that R1 is one of the primordial noise contributors of the amplifier system. Resistor R3 decouples the amplifier ground from the source's ground, effectively breaking any potential ground loops. Diodes D1 and D2 are protection diodes in case there's a fault condition. Resistor R2 couples the amplifier input to ground, defining the DC voltage at the VL terminal of the network and providing a return path for any input bias current of the amplifier. The ground to which R2 couples should be a star ground or a very clean ground. We'll talk more about this when we discuss about amplifier grounding. Finally, R0 couples the input to the source's ground and to the amplifier's ground through R3 to prevent the input terminal from floating when the input source is disconnected. The value of this resistor should be large to not load the input source. On the next video, which is a practical video, we will assign values to the network and perform some simulations. Let's now discuss about the midband gain value. As mentioned earlier, the midband gain should be set to enable full output swing when the amplifier is driven at its rated input sensitivity. In this case, 1 volt RMS. The gain calculation is actually straightforward. Our specification for max output RMS power is 150 watts. We decided this when setting the specs. Since RMS power is output voltage in RMS squared divided by the value of the load resistance, then for a load resistance of 8 ohms, the maximum output voltage in RMS is 34.6 volts RMS. Therefore, for an input sensitivity of 1 volt RMS, the gain needs to be 34.6. We will discuss in a future video how to implement the gain. Now, let's discuss about the value of the power rails. The amplifier power rails should be large enough to accommodate the amplifier's maximum output signal swing and provide enough output headroom to prevent signal compression during maximum power operation. First, let's calculate what the maximum output signal will be and then let's discuss what the output headroom ought to be. In the previous section, we computed that the output signal under maximum output power conditions will be 34.6 volts RMS. To get the peak value, we simply multiply the RMS value by the square root of 2. This results in 49 volts peak. Output headroom is determined by the voltage losses during the maximum output power operation. There are two major sources of voltage loss. Output stage losses, which are due to voltage drops in the devices of the amplifier output stage, and power supply droop. This is due to supply output impedance under heavy load. 
For simplicity, let's assume 5 volts worst case for power supply droop. This is to be confirmed when we design the power supply. If the droop happens to be less than what we are assuming now, we can either crank the gain slightly up or increase the input sensitivity spec or, alternatively, lower the supply rail voltage. Output stage voltage losses are due to BBE, current source compliance, and output resistor losses. Let's analyze how much voltage we lose for each loss component. For this analysis, let's look at the triple emitter follower output stage. Since this stage is fairly symmetrical, I'm going to only consider the top half. The circuit is drawn on the left-hand side of the page. At maximum output power, the amplifier will be sustaining a 49 volt peak as we calculated on the previous slide, and this translates to about 6 amps peak output current into 8 ohms. Now let's take a look at the losses. RE loss is the voltage drop across the meter resistors of the output devices, and it's calculated as the value of the resistor times the current flowing through it. Assuming a typical RE of 0.22 ohms and Assuming that we'll have two output pairs, at least, the voltage across the resistor will be 0.22 ohms times 3 amps, which calculates to 0.7 volts under maximum output current conditions. BBE loss is the sum of the BBE stack of the triple output pair. Assuming a BBE of 0.8 volts for the driver and output transistors, given that they're going to be under heavy current conditions, and 0.7 volts for the pre-driver transistors, we can calculate the VBE loss to be 2.3 volts by just adding these VBE voltages. Finally, current source compliance refers to the minimum voltage required across the current source for it to operate properly. In the shown current source, BR1 is 0.7 volts by construction. Essentially, it has a VBE across it. For high voltage PMP transistors like Q3, I do not recommend running them at BBCs of less than zero under any conditions. As a result, the voltage across the PMP will be 0.7, which results in a total compliance for the current source of 1.4 volts. Adding all these voltage losses, we tally up 4.4 volts of voltage loss under maximum power output conditions. To calculate the power supply requirement then, we just add up the maximum output signal plus the output headroom. In this case, we have an output headroom of 10 volts and a maximum output signal of about 50 volts. I know it was 49, but let's be friends and calculate 50. Adding them up, it turns out that for a 150 watt amplifier, we need 60 volt rails to properly sustain the output signal without compression. I do admit that the calculation is a bit conservative probably by a couple of volts, but as I, as I said before, this gives us a bit of wheel room to maybe adjust either the gain or the input sensitivity of the amplifier. In the next video, which will be a hands-on design video, we'll be designing the input network using LTSpice. In this video, we will calculate the values of the input network and perform verification simulations. If you like the content of this video and want to get notified when the next video is available, please show your support to this channel by subscribing and hitting the thumbs up button for this video. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye friends.